I believe we are finally ready. Let's turn to Acts chapter 18, please. Acts chapter 18. <clears throat> Might work better if I'd turn there myself. Okay, here we are, I believe. No. Good. Okay. Let's have our prayer. Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity we've had to worship you. We pray that our worship truly has been in spirit and truth. We are thankful that we're able to be here at this time to study from the book of Acts. We pray that you will bless our study, that it will bless us and make us stronger in the faith. We pray for those people. Well, we, we pray first of all for the church everywhere. Then we pray especially for the work going on this weekend down in uh, Georgia, that you would bless those folks from Southern Hills who were there and bring them home safely. May all the things that are done everywhere in your name and by your authority bring fruit and bear fruit that many people might come to the Lord. Through his name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to cover as much as we can of Acts chapter 18. Uh, it's uh, one of the shorter chapters we've got left. We're supposed to get through 21. I don't know that we will get through 21, but we're going to try our best to do that. So let's get started with chapter 18, and there are really only three things in this chapter, if you want to outline it. First of all, Paul is going to be at Corinth. That's verses 1 through 17. Then he's going to move on to Antioch. This is Antioch in Syria. That would be verses 18 through 23. And then finally, rather all of a sudden it would seem at first, in verse 24 through the end of the chapter, we're going to meet somebody by the name of Apollos. And what is interesting, not only is Apollos himself, but why he is there at that point in the letter, and as most of you already know, whether we're going to hear anything else about Apollos later, which obviously we are by no later than chapter 19. But let's do 18 first. Here Paul is going from Athens to Corinth in chapter 18, verse 1. I'm just going to, more than reading the text word for word, I think I'll just hit over the high spots and do the best we can to try to finish the chapter. Corinth is approximately 50 miles southwest of Athens. It was considered an important city in its time and had been a very important city maybe in an earlier era. It was a center of both land and sea commerce. It was also known for its sins, for the wickedness that was rampant there. There was a temple, for example, to the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and Aphrodite had 1,000 young ladies who served in that temple as temple priestesses. And priestesses is just a nice name for prostitutes. So prostitution was a large part of the Aphrodite religion, and there was a temple there to that thing, to that particular thing. Okay, you've got Aquila and Priscilla, who had recently come to Corinth from Rome, or from Italy more specifically. Why had they come? They had come because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, according to chapter 18, verse 2. And one commentator says his understanding is before Claudius had them driven out, there may have been as many as 20,000 Jews living in Corinth. And according to the historian Suetonius, an ancient historian, they were driven out, the Jews were. Now watch this, it kind of contradicts itself. The Jews were continually making disturbance 
at the instigation of somebody called Crestus. C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. Who in the world is that? Christ, exactly. So, these Jews, if it is Jews, I would think would be Jewish Christians. But somebody in the name of Christus, which almost certainly is Christ, is making a disturbance, and so Suetonius records that Claudius has them driven out of town. Claudius is the Roman emperor. He will begin his tour of duty in A.D. 41. He will serve as emperor until A.D. 54. He is the nephew of Tiberius Caesar. They all seem to be kin to each other in some way or another. He is described as weak and vacillating. Not a good leader, not a good man. His first wife, whose name I have forgotten, I understand, told him what to do. Uh, she told him what to wear. I'm sure none of you men, your wives tell you what to wear to church on Sunday, like pink shirts and purple shirts and stuff like that. But anyway, his wife told him what to do, so he finally got him a second wife by the, by the name of Agrippina. And Agrippina poisoned him. So things can get worse, you know? Okay. So, here's Agrippina knocks him off. They could have made this program ID that some of you watch on TV all the time. But his reign, according to one source, caused a period of distress over the whole Mediterranean world. It appears to have been a time of rather rampant chaos. Now, the reason I emphasize stuff like that I want you to see what kind of world Paul and Apollos and uh, all these others, Aquila and Priscilla and Peter, what kind of world they're having to function in. What kind of opposition they're facing. I am a news junkie. I mean, I watch every channel. I don't care what it is, how liberal, conservative, or what products they advertise. I watch them all, or I did. I have about gotten to the point that I don't watch much of it. Because, as the fellow said, I'm not just sick and I'm not just tired. I'm sick and tired. It's all left-wing radicalism and it's all anti-moral. and it's cert- Boy, am I on my soapbox. And it is certainly all anti-Christian. Okay, but my point here is, like I made last hour, there's the first century world. Here's the 21st century world. There are too many similarities. And this world, if it's not already, is becoming more and more like that world. Okay, so here you've got. Now you come down to verse 3, and you find out about Aquila and Priscilla. They are tent makers. Tent making was a very good industry. I read in some source, I forget all the different demands that were made for tents. Not only did the army have to have tents, but uh, people who traveled had to have tents. There were no holiday inns. When people came for the Isthmian games, they all stayed in tents. So, anybody who makes tents for a living out of leather or goat hair cloth is going to do pretty well financially. Remember the old Jewish adage... Every Jewish father taught his son a trade, even if he was Saul of Tarsus. His father taught him the trade of tent making. What's the old saying? You take a boy fishing and he catches a fish and you've got food for a day. You teach a boy how to fish and he's got food for every day if the fish are biting. Okay, so that's the kind of philosophy here. Now, Paul stays with Aquila and Priscilla and works with them as a tent maker because he's having to support himself, at least in part. But now notice in verse 4 what he does, and I'm going to look at the text. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Here's what he did. He reasoned. The Nestle text says... He lectured. 
Nobody today likes lectures. I don't know whether they're using the word now in the same sense as they were then, but Paul spoke, and some translations refer to what's going on as dialogue. Others supply words like discuss or dispute or argue. But anyway, Paul is taking on all contenders. And here the language says more exactly that what Paul does is he keeps on reasoning. It's not a one-time deal. He keeps on reasoning. It is a logical, reasoned defense, just like it was in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. He's reasoning in the synagogue because that's where the Jews would be. It's on the Sabbath. That's when the Jews would be assembled there. As a result of which he is able to persuade, or at least he is persistent in trying to persuade, and is successful to some extent in bringing both Jews and Gentiles to Christ. But especially here, we're talking about the Jews. Okay. Paul's work at Corinth is described in verses 5 through 8. Let me just try to read part of that. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, where they had been earlier, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. That's the unwavering point of everything that Paul says and does. He's trying to get the Jews in the synagogues to understand that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. And in doing that, he talks about, among other things, as we've mentioned several times, the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of the Lord. But what he's trying to do is to get the people to see that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Savior of the world. He's the Messiah. That's our responsibility today. It hasn't changed. It is not going to change. We've got to do everything within our power and beyond to convince people that Jesus is the Savior. Some of them aren't even looking for a Savior. Some of them don't care about whether there is a Savior or not. But somebody, in fact everybody, has got to learn sooner or later that there is only one Savior. There's only going to be one Savior, and that's Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Acts 4, 12, a host of other passages. Okay. But notice what the Jews do. They oppose him. They stand in opposition to him. They blaspheme. They speak evil against him. And Paul shook his garments and said to them. Wayne Jackson calls the shaking of the garments a visual act. I don't know how much that tells us. And says he does it to demonstrate his disgust. It would have been the longer outer garment which he would have taken off, he would have still had on the inner garment, and he would have shaken the dust from his garment, I guess, and then put it back on and leave. Did you hear yesterday on TV that uh, the suits the astronauts wore when they walked on the moon were covered with moon dust, and somehow they've been able to preserve those garments, and they have been able to preserve them with the moon dust on them? Wow. Wow. Isn't that something? Okay. In Acts 13, 51, Paul and Barnabas shook off the dust from their feet against the people. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus told his disciples as they went about preaching the gospel that if the city did not receive the apostles, I'm quoting now, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. So to shake off the dust from the feet, to shake off the dust from the garments, was not an unusual thing. It was a way of showing that you would not been well received and that you were not real happy about that. So Paul makes a vow then, and his vow is, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. That becomes the major emphasis of his work, but... 
As we work our way on through the book of Acts, we will see times when Paul will still preach to the Jews as long as the opportunity arises. Paul is never going to turn down the opportunity to tell someone about Jesus. Okay, so there you've got Paul now. It says, I'll go to the Gentiles, verse 7. He departed from there, entered the house of a certain man named Justus, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. We don't know much about Justus beyond what we're told right here. Number one, he's a Gentile. Number two, he's worshipping God. Number three, he lived next door to the synagogue. And we think then that it was from this house that Paul seized the opportunity to preach the gospel. Again, Paul is going to preach the gospel anytime, any place, any way that he can. All right, so that's justice. Now you come to Crispus. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, that makes him one of the chief Jews. Let me lost my place. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household. They become Christians. The ruler of the synagogue becomes a Christian. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. The work in Corinth is fruitful. Maybe not as fruitful as Paul wanted it to be. I don't know that the work was ever as fruitful as Paul really wanted it to be. Whether you're reading Galatians or Corinthians or whatever. Paul wanted everybody to come to Christ, obviously. Okay, now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. That would be the city of Corinth. People heard the gospel, they believed it, they obeyed it, and the Lord said, you keep on preaching and I will keep on taking care of you. I am with you. I'm not going to let anyone uh, take care or attack you to set up on you and hurt you. And so, notice what happens. In verse 11, he continues there for a year and six months, a year and a half, teaching the Word of God among them. Okay, so Paul is doing his work. Then in verse 12, there is a man by the name of Gallio. Now, Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia. He is said to have been the brother of Seneca, the Roman philosopher, Gallio was. He is said also to have been a tutor of Nero and was a great influence on Nero at least in the early AD 50s. Proconsul means that he was the head of the government of all Achaia. He's the big boss. He's number one. So Gallio is proconsul of Achaia And the Jews, with one accord, rose up against Paul, and they brought him, by what appears to be force, to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Now, Gallio is obviously not a Christian. Well, of course, not a Christian. He's obviously not not a Jew. He's a Roman. And here these Jews have come in dragging Paul, and they've got this complaint against Paul because of what he's preaching about God and about Jesus Christ. And in our terminology, Gallio couldn't have cared less. So here's what it says. The charge is, he persuades men to worship God contrary to the law, Some say, well, that could be Roman law, but more likely it's not. More likely it's Jewish law, Moses. So Paul is about to stand up and open his mouth and speak in his own defense. But before he can do that, Gallio says, hold on a minute. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to fool with this. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Here's what he says. If it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, 
there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, your own law makes it obvious it is the law of Moses, look to it yourself, yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. In short, Gallio says, I don't want to have anything to do with this. This is none of my business. I'm not going to make it my business. And look, look what he does in verse 16. He drove them from the judgment seat. The Greeks get all bent out of shape about all this stuff going on. So they take Sosthenes, who is now the ruler of the synagogue. They beat him, the, ju the, the Jew, before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. He's wise enough in one sense of the word as a politician to keep his nose out of business that, number one, he doesn't understand. Number two, he's not interested in learning more about. And number three, he doesn't really see it as a sense of harm or a danger to the people that he's trying to guide in Achaia. Okay, so then, in verse 18 now, Paul is winding down his second missionary journey. He is about to end it by going back to Antioch. Let's read it a little bit. So Paul still remained a good while. He's, he's staying around. But he takes leave of the brethren, and he sails for Syria. Now this Syria, Syrian Antioch, this is the supporting congregation. It's basically what we would call today the sponsoring church. So anyway, he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Now here comes something a little strange that we don't really completely understand, or at least I don't. He had his hair cut off at Sincrea. For he had taken a vow, his hair cut off because he had taken a vow. Okay. Sincrea is a seaport that serves the city of Corinth. Corinth was such a center of commercial traffic, especially by water, but by land as well, that they actually had two seaports. And this one was six and a half miles from the city itself. At this point, when they arrive at Sincrea, Saul, or Paul, I'm sorry, decides to get his hair cut off because he has taken a vow. Now, the problem is, we don't know what this vow was. Because it simply does not say. And I think the most often speculated answer to the question is, well, this must have been a Nazarite vow. Well, let me go back here to the Old Testament if I can find it fairly quickly. I'm going to read from Numbers chapter 6. I've got to go back a couple of more pages. Numbers chapter 6. I'm going to start at verse 13. Now listen to this in view of what's going on at Sincrea. Now this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall present his offering to the Lord, one male lamb in its first year without blemish as a burnt offering, one ewe lamb in its first year without blemish as a sin offering, one ram without blemish as a peace offering, a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and their grain offering with their drink offerings. Did I read the right chapter? I did, didn't I? Okay. Then there's all this other material that goes off. And then verse 18, 
The Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the door of the tabernacle of meeting and shall take the hair from his consecrated head and put it on the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. None of this except the actual cutting of the hair. None of what was done in Paul's case seems to have been done in direction of keeping a Nazarite vow. So the conclusion drawn by any number of people who have studied this is, whatever this is, this is not a Nazarite vow. For Saul of Tarsus turned Paul the apostle in the first place was not a Nazarite. Now we've had people through the years, some of them very fine scholars, some of them maybe not, who have tried real hard to prove that John the Baptist was a Nazarite. I don't think we can prove that. Sounds good. Guy living out in the boonies by himself, wearing that weird-looking outfit that he wears, not cutting his hair, and lots of other things he's not doing, and maybe he should be eating a weird diet. Oh, he got to be... No, he doesn't have to be a Nazarite. We can't prove that. But we certainly cannot prove that Paul was a Nazarite now, Paul does say something in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, about accommodating Jewish custom. Did that play into this? I don't know. It may have, it may not have. Or is this, and I think this was Wayne Jackson suggesting, I didn't document that, is this strictly a personal matter? And if so, what was the personal matter? And we don't know whether it was a personal matter or not, and we don't know if it was what the personal matter was. That makes sense? So, in all of that, we've got a complicated question that doesn't have an easy answer. And this is not the only place in the Bible where we're going to have that. So you do the best you can with the information you've got, and we don't have enough information here to say what the vow was or why Paul cut his hair, but he did. Let's go ahead. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue, and once again, there's that word, he reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent. He didn't agree to do so, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. Okay. He finally lands at Caesarea. He goes up to the church, probably at Jerusalem, and goes back down to Antioch, makes his report, if he hasn't always made his, or already made his report. After he had spent some time there, he departed. Now we're launching into the third missionary journey. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Perga in order, strengthening all the disciples. The second and third missionary journeys seem to have been very much to confirm the congregations and the Christians he'd established on the first journey. Okay, so that gets us now out of the second missionary journey and into the third and we come now to the last section, which I think it's good if we can spend the... I can't really see that clock, how much time we've... Oh, we've got 10 minutes. Okay. I want to talk about Apollos for just a couple of minutes or more. There was a certain Jew. His name was Apollos. He was born at Alexandria in Egypt, prominent city in Egypt, prominent city in biblical studies, actually, uh, especially in more recent times. It is said of Apollos that, first of all, he is an eloquent man. That's verse 24. Now, what exactly does eloquent mean? It has been suggested that there are a number of possible things this is saying about Apollos. 
He is learned. He is an orator. He is distinguished and cultured and educated. And furthermore, he is mighty in the Scriptures. He is powerful or strong in the Scriptures. Excuse me. Especially in the Old Testament. He has been instructed in the way of the Lord, verse 25 says. Most people think the word instructed here means basically he was taught orally the way of the Lord. He is fervent in spirit, which means he is enthusiastic. Uh, the word literally means boiling over. He's boiling over with enthusiasm. Uh, you've all had that experience, you know, you put something on the stove to heat up, and you go off in the next room and you get engrossed in something else, till all of a sudden you hear the noise that lets you know the lid on the kettle or whatever is rattling and you're about to have an explosion on your stove. Probably do before you get there, so it's water sprayed everywhere. Well, Apollos is described here as like a pot boiling over with enthusiasm. It is used in some places to describe the Apostle Paul as well. And there are other places where it's not used to describe him, but you know. Ephesians 3 is a prime example. You know he's boiling over. Okay. He is speaking and teaching accurately, verse 25 says. Speaking and teaching accurately the things of the Lord, that would have to be, I would think, the Lord Jesus Christ, though he knew only the baptism of John, and the John considered there obviously has to be the John the Baptist. Let me go ahead and finish the chapter, and then we'll come back. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Keep that phrase in mind, the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren rode, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly showing from the Scriptures. This is after he's been taught the way of the Lord more accurately by Aquila and Priscilla, showing from the Scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Now, you almost cannot understand what this means until you come to chapter 19. But we're not going to come to chapter 19 until next week, Lord willing. So let me see if I can just kind of set this up and then we'll get into some detail next week. Apollos, who has been instructed orally, if it is orally, in the way of the Lord, knows about the Messiah. But apparently, he himself had been baptized during the ministry of John the Baptist. Apollos had. Was he baptized by John the Baptist himself? It doesn't say. And we don't know. But apparently, or obviously, I would think, from what's said here, the only baptism that Apollos knows is the baptism of John the Baptist, which includes, as you'll see in chapter 19, an agreement on the part of those being baptized under John's baptism to accept the Messiah when he came. Okay. So John, I'm sorry, Apollos is going around preaching what he knows about Christ, whatever that is, however much that is, but he is still, if he administers baptism, which I would imagine that he did, he baptizes according to the baptism of John the Baptist. The problem is that this is after the baptism of John the Baptist is no longer valid. Remember, we're in Acts, what, uh, 18? 19, actually, is where we are now. It's been a long time since we were in Acts 2. The new order 
had been, had been established in Acts 2. So the baptism of John the Baptist is no longer in effect. We are under the one baptism, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, that is immersion for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ by which we're added to the church. So he apparently is still preaching the necessity of being baptized according to the baptism of John the Baptist, I repeat, after that baptism is no longer in effect. Now why that's important is next week when we get to chapter 19, Paul is going to meet some fellows who apparently have been baptized under or by the baptism of John the Baptist, which again is no longer in effect. It doesn't say who baptized those disciples in Acts 19. It doesn't say that John the Baptist did, but it doesn't say that John the Baptist didn't either. But my guess, for whatever that's worth, that and two dollars will buy you a cup of coffee down here. What's the name of this place twice daily? Yeah, okay. My guess is, it is at least possible that those disciples in Acts 19 were baptized by Apollos. And so here you've got Apollos all of a sudden in the middle or toward the end of chapter 18. Wham! There he appears. Where did he come from? What's he doing here? What's this all about? And you won't be able to answer that completely and fully until you come to chapter 19 and you say, oh, here's the problem. Now, how do we solve the problem? And to get ahead of ourselves, because we've got about two minutes left. What this teaches, among other things, and this is the most important thing maybe for us, what this teaches, among other things, is that you can be baptized for the wrong reason. I think that's the key. You can be baptized for the wrong reason. It happens all the time. It happens in churches of different kinds. Some people baptize for one reason, some for another reason. I don't know. We won't get into that today. But I think what we've got in Acts 19 is these disciples who were baptized under the baptism of John the Baptist after the baptism of John the Baptist is no longer in effect. And so what does Paul have to do with these men? He has to baptize them by immersion in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ in order that they might receive the remission of all of their past sins and become New Testament Christians who are added to the Lord's church. Okay, just keep all of that in mind because we will, uh, we will get on into that when we get to 19 and and see how much of 19 we can cover next week. But I thought it would be good to introduce that and kind of set it up. We had the time for that, and it kind of gets us ready then for what we're going to do next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all of your blessings. We ask you to be with us and use us in your service to your glory always. We are thankful for every blessing you give us, especially those spiritual blessings that are ours in and through Jesus Christ. Once again, we pray you'll be with our people down in Georgia, bring them all home success, successful or, or safely after a successful work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here.